Hi, welcome to Shop Talk Live. This is episode 312. My name's Amanda Russell. I'm Ben Strana. And we are, well, Ben, you're going to tell me what we're discussing yeah, you have no week. idea what we're doing today. I No clue. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so today I talked to, uh, you know, our favorite, Vic Teslin, and the one and only Andrew Hunter. Love that. Yeah. Yes. Andrew's great. Andrew is fantastic and just as passionate as they get. In the past, when we've had him on, it's only been about Japanese tools. And I, I, I all of a sudden was like, you know what? We're pigeonholing them. So, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of Japanese tools in there. It's Andrew Hunter. Come on. Have to. We, we had a question come in about how do you know that you're sharp? And when, when I think about people who know sharp, I don't know if I know anyone who knows sharp better than Andrew Hunter. That's a perfect question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a question that comes in from a viewer listener about uh, a mismatched board that's bothering them in their dining room tabletop and what to do about that, uh, especially given that there is tapered sliding dovetails holding the whole thing together at the bottom. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't wait for this. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have we have a listener uh, who writes in from Atlanta, and they're looking at houses, and it looks like they're probably on the verge of buying a house with a carpeted basement that would become the okay. shop, and what uh, what that would look like in a shop. How would how would you feel about a, a shop with a carpet? I don't know if I could handle that. <laughs> I, I I have strong feelings about carpet. <laughs> okay. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Strong feelings about carpet. So I don't, yeah, that might not work for me, but All right. I would love to hear opinions on that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get yeah. them. Um, but then also you, now I know what you did this week. Who do you talk to? Uh, Sophie Glenn, who is also from Pennsylvania um, and a friend of mine who's a great woodworker slash metal worker. Mm -hmm. So we talk a little bit about her work and an upcoming show she's in called Seating Assignment. Mm -hmm. um, it's a real interesting little conversation, just diving into her process and her approach and uh, why she does what she does. I guess we always have to uh, make sure that everyone knows to head on over to findwoodworking.com slash e-learning and find out more about Mike's uh, design class. Are you excited about doing the Q and A's with Mike? I re I am. I'll be moderating the Q and A's. I'm excited to like see what people come up with and how yeah. he gives feedback. It's going to be a good. Head on over to findorderking.com/elearning and soon issue number three ten will be hitting everyone's mailboxes. So check that out. Find Woodworking New England too. So yeah, exciting event coming yeah. up. I can't wait for that one. A lot of exciting stuff in the Fine Order King world right now. And more to come. Until then, here is me, Vic, Andrew Hunter. Boom. Always be recording. Vic. Yes. You just told me you want to get rid of your drill press. Okay, so first of all, I didn't <laughs> say I was going to get rid of my drill press. I just think that it's possible to get rid of the drill press because I have one of those, um, fancy drill guides that have like, like not the, not the cheap version, the good versions uh -huh. that have like proper, uh, bushings and all that other kind of stuff. The downfall to those, um, jigs to my mind is the fact that they only, they only came with a 10 millimeter chuck, which is not big enough to spin a Forstner. Now, I know already people are like, are already on their keyboard saying, you don't want to spin a Forstner with a hand drill. <laughs> okay. Yes, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, is that as I've had this jig and I've been using it more often than not, I'm taking the jig to the work versus the work to the drill press. I don't know about this. And so I, I kind of get it. It I makes mean, me I'm, uncomfortable. I'm not getting rid of my drill press, but I kind of get where he's coming from. <laughs> right. And, and so my question then is like, okay, well, first of all, I don't know that I would get rid of the drill press in the first place. Um, but if a person had limited space, could they replace the, a drill press with 
one of these drilling jigs. And I think, I'm not 100%, but I think you can. Maybe the argument is not replaced, but um, if, if you don't have either, you could start with um, right. the, the, the guide. Um, but man, I, I couldn't imagine living without a drill press. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I, my gut reaction to, to Andrew, to catch you up, uh, my gut reaction to Vic was, no, I think the drill press is the last power tool I get rid of. Um, no, in fact, that wasn't your reaction. Your reaction was no. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we're bordering on a tantrum. <laughs> This is what you people don't see and hear when Ben is doing all his editing. <laughs> the it's the fury. it's the preamble that all right, got, is really salty. Yes, yeah. it just it just it no one will ever hear anything negative that I do or say on the podcast. <laughs> That's why you have to come to an event. Um, right. <laughs> but uh so so my my gut reaction is the the drill press is the last power tool I get rid of. And then Vic, you followed up with, well, why, like, why, why do you feel that way? And now all of a sudden I'm questioning everything <laughs> because I don't have other than just convenience. And for one very specific purpose that, uh, I use one of those, um, safety planes, which like is the sketchiest looking tool ever in the history of tools. It is basically, it's a, it's a, it looks like a big Forstner bit with a flat bottom that has three blades mounted oh, to the yeah. bottom of it. And it's, it's a plane, you know, it's, it's used for planing small pieces of wood. Um, and it scares me to death every single time. And I am very, very respectful of that tool, but you're right. I think you could probably find bandsaw still the last one I get rid of. Uh, and it's true. You do end up like I, I have a bench top um, drill press and I end up moving it onto my bench and drilling something on my bench. So it, it's still mobile, but it's still strong enough to hold um, a bit still. Are, is Andrew, is your shop still split where you have like your main hand tool work area bench room and then most of your power tools outside? No, it's all okay. in. Uh, but it is split. There's sort of a hand tool room and there's a power tool room, but they're not divided anymore. Okay. Um, but for the most part, dust happens in another section and hand plane shavings <laughs> and everything beautiful happen in a, in a different section. Cool. Um, but I, I hear you Vic cause, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you can't get what you want to drill underneath the drill press. Especially if it's a smaller drill press. I'm like yep. you, I have a bench top one, although I feel like uh, mine might be a little bigger than yours only because I would, I would blow something apart if I picked it up and, <laughs> and put it on the bench by myself. Um, we don't have to get yes. into details about no, that. I, I, but... think, I think we have the same size and yes. <laughs> Andrew's, it's Andrew's just... It's, it's very heavy. Yeah. And so that's one of those things where it's like, um, but I find that the tables are so small and then you put an auxiliary table on, but then the auxiliary table is sort of this precipice hanging way out on the edge here. And I feel like there's no support there. And so for some things I've even used it horizontally, this jig wow. where I could like clamp it to something and then drill yeah. straight in. And I was like, Whoa, that's cool. Can't do that with a drill press. Can you, yeah. can you I, clamp it to like the edge of a board for if you were doing like dowel joinery or this one you like can, it actually has two pins that will offset or will, um, orient the base. Oh, so, so like that center finding dead center. Yeah. yeah. And then you clamp it, you can clamp it onto the edge and then drill joinery that way. Huh? You're, you're making, you're convincing us. <laughs> um, so how do you like, how would one drill a hole in the middle of their bench for a bench dog? Uh, with a drill press they can't you know they, there's not enough throw to it uh to reach in the middle and it's too heavy to move and 
And doing it by eye sounds like something you should be able to do, but <laughs> I've not, just always yeah. said I didn't want that to be straight, anyways. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. It's like drive. It's like it's like piloting a helicopter, right? You're trying to balance a, a surfboard on the head of a pin. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with the you know. I know there there is ways and there's mirrors and lasers and, <laughs> but if you just wanted to like quickly drill a hole, like I don't know. It's interesting to the point where I've actually used it. And this is really overkill, but I've actually used it to drill pilot holes in things such that the pilot hole is either straight or I can offset it by a degree or two and sort of do a bit of a toenailing sort of situation with a screw. Um, so that's actually how I do most of my drilling, like on a bench seat or something at an angle. On my drill press, I'll I'll take the time to get a small, like an eighth inch diameter hole, drill it at the exact angle that I want. Then I go over to my bench top, um, put an eighth inch pilot through, and then use an auger bit, um, and it follows that eighth inch. Oh, okay. Um, you know, angled hole exactly. You know, it mm. it it can't stray. the The auger on the tip of the bit just follows that. Auger, original eighth inch hole. Auger snail. in a in, in a hand drill or yeah yeah yep. okay huh that's cool um, e- even put it in a power drill yeah and use it but it needs that threaded um, auger on the front to follow the, the the hole and that way you can you know drill angled you know angled holes in a in a chair seat over and over at the same angle pretty easily yeah you know? yeah it goes through yeah, the path no. of least resistance so that hole gives yep. it that. That's cool. Yep. See, this it is why it. I hit record. So, nah. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so, Andrew, what have you been up? I, I, like, I know you've been teaching a lot. What have you, you've been, you were down in Austin not long ago. Yeah, I just got back from Austin. Um, certainly in Connecticut a bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it, there's been a lot of teaching this year. Honestly, it, I'm a little burned out. March. <laughs> Um, or no, February was heavy. Yeah. February was every weekend and that's, I'm a homebody. Okay. Um, and that I felt that at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I really love getting out and kind of sharing and inspiring and just feeling like I'm making a difference. Um, I love being in my shop too, though. So it's, it's finding the balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we're all introverted extroverts. Exactly. <laughs> like we like to be out in front of people and sharing what we know and all that other stuff, but it gets to the point where it's just like, I need to be in my cave right now. Run back home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, so the weekend classes are great. That's, I, I can do that pretty well. I can, I can hold it together and, uh, and then, and then race home on Monday. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I'm sure doing more than, one class a month would be mentally draining because you, you are, you are. So like when you're doing classes, sometimes it's, um, the, the one class I always want to take is, uh, setting up a Japanese hand plane, like Mm -hmm. from, that's that's my favorite. Uh, Honestly, (laughs) it might just come down to that class. (laughs) (laughs) But like, it's, it's, uh, it's like from out, like from the package out of the box, out of the box. Yeah. And that's that's the hard thing with Japanese planes is they don't work out of the box, yeah. and it's and it's two days, full days to to make it make a shaving. Um, so that's that's challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, well Ben, you let me know. Sign up. You let me know when yeah, you're going to take up. that course, and I'll come with you. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. So so I'm at the uh, the new Wendell Castle School as well, teaching that course in July. They're, nice. they're getting um, everyone. You're there. Vic's there. Yeah. Loris yep, is there. Awesome. It's like they listen yeah. to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it must be it. That's awesome. That's and uh, so that's in Rochester. So that's not that far from you. Exactly. Right? I can <clears throat> yeah. I can do that. I can be out and back. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's within my my easy Your happy tolerance place. mode. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. yeah. I think it's an hour drive for me um, Ooh, to get to yeah, Rochester. So I should look. Are there any spaces left in your class? I don't know. Actually, I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> we'll post a yeah. link for you, Vic. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Do that. <laughs> there's definitely, you know, there's... It'll be on the show notes with the other. I, It'll be yeah, there. It, it's, folks, it's, it's always check the show notes. 
I'm not great. We're we're not the best. We're not perfect. But check the show notes. If we're talking about something, we 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 really do try and put it in the show notes. There was a there was a couple of emails from from people who are like, uh, nobody nobody said the date of fine woodworking New England, and and like they emailed multiple people, and it was like just go shoptalklive.com. Like oh, if if we're talking about something, always check shoptalklive.com first. So let's just dive right in. Let's go full full dork, full full sharpening geek, right right from the get go. This question's from All Dave. Right. Yeah, let's let's not hold back. Come on. How do you measure sharpness in a normal home shop atmosphere? I love I love that because he's like, I've seen the YouTube videos with this with the thing, you know, like everybody's seen the measuring sharpness, with the thing. microscopes, yeah. and uh... um, I've heard and seen lots of methods. Shave hair off your arms, carve a sliver off your fingernail, um, slice a piece of paper without sawing, uh, and see if you can shave end grain. Are there more measurable or repeatable approaches that don't require an electron microscope? Uh, and continues on to say, to say, love the show. It gets me to and from the office most days. I have a notepad on the armrest of my car to write down techniques, tool tips, books, etc. that catch my ear. It's becoming an expensive notebook. We apologize, <laughs> Dave. Okay, so uh, let's just let's just go through one at a time. You two, yay or nay? Uh, is it shaving hair off your arms? No, no, no. Okay. Um, is it slicing your fingernail? No, well, okay, no. yeah. Thank you. Please, no. <laughs> can can we can we straighten that one out? I don't think it's slicing your fingernail. It's seeing if it catches on your fingernail, right? Right. Yeah. So the technique, as I was taught it, was that you take the weight of the blade just on your fingernail, and you give just a light push, and if yeah. it grabs immediately, it's sharp. If it skates, it's not. But yeah. I don't. That's to me because angles matter. Okay. And it, that's not a good way to do things. And when you do it, it gives you that funny feeling in your bathing suit area. Yeah. And I don't like that. <laughs> well, I actually, I went through a fingernail with a hand plane. It's a long story. We don't want to talk about it, but it takes about nine months for that to fix itself. Okay, folks. Um, Testing to see if it was sharp. No, I, no, I was, I was planing a really thin, a really small piece of wood in my hand. Oh. And just zink, and like right, it was a sharp blade. I'll tell you that right okay. through the fingernail. And there was like just basically, people are cringing. I apologize. Um, there was basically just like a little oval cut out of my fingernail for months. So, um, okay, sawing through a piece of paper without sawing or slicing through a piece of paper. No, yeah, you know, not for me. All right, Andrew, yeah, Andrew, Andrew's lightened up a little bit on the on the guttural reaction. Uh, seeing if you can shave end grain. No, I, I, those are not my methods. All right. I will say that those are, those are methods. Um, they're not <laughs> <laughs> my method. Diplomatic. Truer words Diplomatic. have not been spoken. <laughs> <laughs> those are definitely right methods. <laughs> All right. Mr. Hunter. All right. I'm, I'm excited for this one. Uh, anyone who has taken my classes has heard this. Um, I see it. I see the light on the tip of the chisel. Um, and again, so uh, a perfectly sharp edge will come to a perfect point and will not have a surface area. Um, a dull chisel will have an area at the tip that will actually reflect light. Um, and that's... That's what I look for. So I hold it in the light. And again, the sunlight uh, is so much more powerful than any light. Um, if I can hold it in a direct beam of sunlight while I'm in the shadow um, in such a way that the tip is reflecting that light at an equal and opposite direction as it comes in uh, to my eye, um, that's what I look for. And I move it back and forth. And all of a sudden, you'll see a white line radiate on the very tip of the chisel. And that's dull. Okay. Okay. Um, and I sharpen until that disappears, basically. Um, and sometimes I look and I see white spots, and those are more chips. Uh, less dull, more chipping, uh, probably too low of, a, uh, of an angle on the, on the chisel. Um, but it's all by eye, and it's something you get good at. And it's something, you know, I can see right away, but students, it's hard, but I encourage them to keep looking, keep looking, and then they will see it. And as soon as you see it once, um, 
you'll know it's there and it's much easier to see. Um, so it's, it's hard at first, but when you refine your eyes, it will be very obvious. And then you will never look at another Instagram video of people sharpening, <laughs> uh, showing a sharp <laughs> blade again. Your eye goes right to the tip, looking for that band of white light. Um, so to tell the truth. I, right now I'm imagining you in a movie theater and there's the bad guy holding a knife and there's the glint of light on the knife <laughs> yes. and, and you just stand up and say, that's a dull knife. That's Go nothing. Ahead. And walking right out. That's Try that your one. best. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we are looking for the absence of something, which is always more difficult than looking for something. <laughs> You're, yep. You do not want to see the glint of light. And that's all and you it's, do. It's on, it's on both sides. Um, you know, when it's dull, I can really look from the bevel side or the back side. Uh, and as I'm sharpening, it will disappear on the bevel side, but it will still be there on the, on the back side. And that's sort of the wear bevel where it's, where it's rubbed the back of the blade and actually left it not perfectly flat. And again, that little bit of light will reflect. So it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's subtle. So, um, but again, as you get better at it, it's glaringly obvious. Um, so, in 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 practice, um, the back of the the back of the blade is you know when you start off after you're done setting that blade up, it's perfectly flat, right? But over time, it does get dubbed over a little bit, if you will. And now, when you're sharpening, and this. This is kind of a silly sentence, but if you're sharpening for anything other than a competition, like a Kez or something like Which that. The only sharpening I really do. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Work sharpening. Would you go go after that glint of light on the back as well? Or are you looking to get rid of the, the glint of light on the bevel? So first, uh, as I'm using the tool... Uh, I'm looking for the glint on, on the tip. Okay. Um, whether it's from the bevel side or the back side, if I see it, it's dull, I go sharpen. I start sharpening, um, then I can feel a burr. Uh, and the tip, the tip is rounded, but there's still an apex. Okay. Um, there's a left side and a right side that's or a top and a bottom side that's rounded, um, not just one side. Um, so at that apex, you're going to start forming a burr. And you might feel the burr and think you're done sharpening, but you haven't got the backside roundness out. Uh, you've simply reached the apex of the point, um, but both sides are round. You got one out. Um, so that's when I look to the back while I'm sharpening for that last little bit of wear bevel um, to, to disappear, basically to, for that glint of light to disappear. And then I know um, I'm done sharpening. So it's both tells me when to start sharpening and tells me when to stop sharpening. Okay. Basically. Yeah. And again, it's, it's very subtle. Um, I can only encourage you to look and look and look again. Uh, and it'll get much easier to see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have not gotten there yet, so I will, I need to, you look, I, I, <laughs> I, and again, sunlight is so a light in your shop is good, but sunlight is just tells you much more than you probably want to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing I have in my shop are those um, work lights with a magnifying glass in the middle and a, and a round light around it. Mm -hmm. That works really well. So it's magnifying maybe about five um, and it has the direct light source above it. So I, I, a lot of times use that. Okay. What, yeah. what about you? I mean, you seem to be right, right there with Andrew. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Um, so, um, I knew this old carver who used to make these humongous, uh, carved signs, you know, like apothecary signs and they would be painted and gold leafed and all that other stuff. And so this guy, I learned more about sharpening, just watching this guy work than, um, than, than anything I've ever read in a book. And so he said to me, what he was taught, and this guy was like a hundred years old, you know, give or take. And, um, he said he was taught, if you see something, you got nothing. And I thought, well, that's interesting. He said, if you look at your, at the edge of your tool and you see something, you're dull. And so, and how I, and Andrew's right, trying to explain that to people is weird because you're telling them to look for something that's not there, 
right? Or something that's not supposed to be there. And so when I, when I teach that technique, what I do is I get them to turn the chisel with the, with the back towards them. And I said, you see how like you have to like, you have to turn it in order to get your reflection so that you can see your eyes in that. Now do that with the edge. Move okay. it back and forth until you're like you're trying to get that glint okay. in the eye because there's this whole, you know, angle of incidence and angle of refraction and all that other stuff. So you're rotating it so that you can see it. And as soon as and Andrew's right, as soon as you see it once you'll never not see it again. And so, and in fact, you'll, it you'll will wish. haunt you. <laughs> <laughs> <It will. laughs> you'll wish you didn't see it. See, I never see the glint cause I don't look. So, <laughs> so, so that's, that's the most important thing I think, um, is wanting to see it. Yeah. Right. Um, because you want to get back to work. You want your chisel to be sharp. <laughs> so the first thing you need to do is change that. You need to, uh, want <laughs> to see that it's dull. Uh, and then you'll be able to see that it's dull. Un unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the first step. Yeah. It's, um, uh, and then the other lesson that that same carver taught me, he would, he would work for about five minutes and then he would go right over to his strop and he would strop his tool and then go right back to work. And I'm thinking to myself, that tool's not dull yet. Can't be right. Cause he's working in this beautiful pattern grade mahogany. And these are like, you know, the, the, the file chisels and it's like, that's not dull. I said, why do you sharpen so much? And he said, I was taught that because carving tools have weird shapes and, you know, they're, they're, he said, if you grind once, polish forever. And so his thought is, is like, don't let your tool get to the point where it's so dull that you have to do a bunch of remedial work to it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, isn't that kind of cool? And so when he taught me that, so now I will pull a blade out of a plane. I will take the chisel over to the Tormac and I will just, I will touch it up super quick. Like takes me 10 seconds, but I'll do it every couple of minutes, especially like chopping dovetails. If it's hardwood or whatever, back to the, back to the, the hone all the time. And I literally can't remember the last time I had to use the grind wheel. Hmm. because I'm just constantly keeping that chisel as as sharp as I can. Well, I guess that comes back to like, you know, getting again, same, same as before you got to want it, but like getting comfortable setting up your hand plane quickly, you know, and, and, yeah. and being familiar with it enough. And I think a lot of people, uh, myself at times included will no, it's cutting. Just let's just keep going with it, <laughs> you know. So, what? Well, and hand planes don't mysteriously stop cutting, <laughs> right? Like when you're, I always tell people, like you're you're hand planing, you're getting these beautiful gossamer shavings. Life is good. All of a sudden, the plane stops cutting, mm -hmm. right? Ninety nine percent of us will grab that adjuster or a hammer, and oh, it's not. It just needs to be a little bit further out. Right. And now what you've done is you've increased the size of the cut with a duller blade and you're only going to get away with that twice, maybe three times. <laughs> and then, then you're going to tear out a huge <laughs> chunk and you're going to yeah. swear and you're going to curse and everything else. But the yeah. plane told you. Yeah. You just, and all that time um, that you, that you were not sharpening. Uh, that you're going to have to now repair uh, the work that you did because you were dull. Um, it would have been much faster to go get sharp really quickly uh, and get back to it, you know? And again, to get sharp really quickly means having that set up. You know, there's no getting it out of the drawer. It is set up. You go over there, bang it out right back. Um, it will save you time in the long run. How long does it take? Um, like I know Bob Van Dyke is, you know, two and a half minutes. He's back to work after sharpening. Like he, times himself or whatever. Andrew, uh, I, I, I don't know how difficult it is with a Japanese hand plane to, to dial it back in. How, how no, it, it's honestly the, the same as a Western. Um, again, it's how dull it gets. Um, when I'm finished planing, it's a five minute job. If I'm doing rough work on the site and I come back and I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> it's a 10, 15 minute okay. job. 
Um, so it really, and, and like Vic said, is this, stay sharp. It, it'll just make life easier. Um, so I have another method. Okay. If you really, really want to dial it in. Um, and this gets to the Kazerikai um, thin shaving uh, level. Can can you um, can you real quick uh, give a two sentence yes. Kazerikai? Yeah, uh, Kazerikai is an organization first formed in Japan. Um, now we have a Kazerikai USA um, sister chapter, and uh, it's a lot of things, but it's mostly Japanese tool education. Um, but we really love to take thin shavings, get together, take thin shavings together. And measure those shavings and study those shavings. <laughs> total, yes. yes. Total geek fest. Wonderful um, levels but, of geekery. But it is that shaving that's going to tell you everything about your the tip of your blade. Um, so let's say you're making a... Um, so we have these contests where you have to make a full width, full length shaving. Um, if you can get a full length shaving without a void in it, without a, a tear or anything in it, at 20 microns, it means there is not a scratch in your blade deeper than 20 microns. Um, and as you start getting a thinner shaving, you get down to 15 microns, you start getting these holes in your shaving. Can that tells you that there is a scratch in your blade 15 microns deep, uh, and it is now showing up um, in that shaving, okay. which it wouldn't have in the 20. Can, all right, so microns are hard to wrap your head around. I know that like water filters are sold in micron levels, right? Yes, so, so forget forget the micron, but, but the point is, is when I'm in my shop working, um, if I want to see if a blade is sharp, I put my blade into my plane, I have a scrap piece of wood, I take a shaving on. And I take as thin as a shaving as I can and read that shaving, and that really tells me what's going on on the tip, more than my eyes can see. Um, and yes, it is down into microns, mm -hmm. which um, you don't have to measure. But uh, the, the idea, the thin shaving starts to show um, the imperfections in, in your blade, which is telling you the imperfections in the surface of the wood. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's all related, you know, that when you go from 20 microns or a, a thick shaving, <laughs> um, or a, the 20 microns is pretty thin, but um, if you get a full shaving with 20 microns, then you know you don't have a void in your blade that deep. Okay. And as soon as you get thinner down to 15 and the void starts showing up, that's how you know how deep your, your scratches are or, you know, imperfections. All so right. now I know yeah. that 15 microns, I mean, we're already, that's already in metric. It's yeah. We, what yeah, is we that? Even... <laughs> what is that in Imperial? Like what would 15 microns be Stupid in thousands thin. of an inch? 10 thousandths of uh, an inch? I, I think hair is 70 microns. I think the cells in our, in the tree are like 20 microns. Okay. Um, so thin. <laughs> 15 microns but, but, but again, to inches would be. It's half a thousandth a of, a, of a millimeter. Half a thou of an inch. I, it's I, again. I, I I hate this conversation because it's <laughs> it's like I don't understand how big a micron is. And um, no, but it's I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Because <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. like yeah. honestly though, when you're when you're working when you're building furniture, you're not like worried about the fifteen the no. the, the micron level. No. But when you're hanging out with your friends, seeing how thin of a shaving you can get and, you know, the camaraderie and the fun of a, exactly. of a Kazurikai, yes, of course. it's. But so, so that hanging out is telling us how sharp we are. That that game that we play at these Kazurikai events um, or just in our hangings, you know, in our weekend hang, um, it is telling us how sharp we are. That's, that's why we play the yeah. game. Um, and that's why we're trying to get thinner and thinner and yet still remain a full shaving because that means there's no imperfections in the blade of, of that depth. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a game, it's, you know, it's a way to geek out, but it really is an education on what you can't see. Yeah. Um, it, it quantifies um, the non quantifiable. It, it gives it a number. And, and there, there isn't um, like a hazing where the person with the thickest shaving has to buy like beer next of course time, right? There is. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run around the building with like cheese yeah. under your armpits. And <laughs> what did they do to you in the army, dude? It was bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, <laughs> tell you what, let's take a quick break, get a drink of water, think about microns. Cool. Uh, 
Sutherland Wells believes that your exceptional craftsmanship deserves an exceptional finish. They handcraft their full line of low and VOC exempt finishes and stains with the highest quality, cold pressed, sustainably grown tongue oil. Their polymerization process gives you the grain enhancing, wood nurturing, deep penetration and non-yellowing protection of raw tongue oil, but decreases drying time and allows the oil to both penetrate and build a film finish. Sutherland Wells Traditional Oil Aesthetic for the Contemporary Woodworker. Use code FWW24 for 10% off your first order. I'm Sophie Glenn, and I live in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, I make steel furniture, essentially. So uh, my recent body of work, which I title Rust Never Sleeps, is a series of sort of classic furniture designs that I recreate completely out of uh, steel. Um, and to do that, I usually do a variation of different uh, metalworking processes and, and also woodworking processes that I sort of incorporate into um, the fabrication techniques. Um, and then I paint and rust the pieces so they look like kind of aged antique wooden pieces of furniture. Um, and I got into doing that through my uh, uh, first through college. I, I was a sculpture major in college at SUNY Purchase College in upstate New York. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be in that program when they had a Wingate Artist in Residence program, and I met Vivian Beer through that program, who is another uh, furniture maker and uh, metal fabricator. Uh, so I took a class with her and absolutely fell in love with uh, welding and metal fabrication, and then um, I really fell in love with furniture at that same time, too. Uh, so I've slowly started to um, build up that, that kind of body of work and make more metal furniture and get more metal working jobs and some woodworking jobs here and there. Uh, I wanted to, after I graduated, I went to San Diego State University for grad school um, just to get a little bit more of a woodworking education. Um, and Wendy Maruyama was still there at the time, so I was able to learn from her a little bit um, and get a really great experience out of that. Uh, and that was a three-year program. So after that, I did a residency at the Appalachian Center for Craft, which is in Smithville, Tennessee. And I was there as a woodworking resident, but that's actually where I started this body of work, the Rust Never Sleeps Works. Um, so while I was there, there was a lot of opportunities for like studio visits and they did like a lot of community based like programming and things like that. So I had someone visit my studio and at the time I was making like wood and steel stuff. Um, and the steel was like kind of either powder coated or patina. So it didn't really look like raw metal at all. Um, and I had someone comment on my work, like, where's all the steel parts? Like, what kind of wood is this part made of? And they were pointing at, like, the steel piece. Oh, okay. It frustrated me so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was just like, well, if people are just going to assume that my pieces are made out of wood. I might as well play into that and actually make them look like wood, even though they're not. So that's that was kind of the inspiration behind that body of work. And that's what I've been make, working on ever since, really. Yeah. yeah. Could could you go a little bit more into, you said you incorporate woodworking techniques into steelwork. What's like an example of that? Sure. Um, so one I started doing was kerf bending specifically because um, oh, okay. cool. at the time I only had, I wasn't, like I said, a woodworking residency. So I didn't really have a whole lot of equipment to use. So I had only my welder and my angle grinder at the time. So I needed a way to actually bend pieces of steel or and like tubing and stuff like that without using like heat or um, any kind of other like fancy tool that I didn't have. Uh, so I incorporated um, kerf bending, which is like for, for those who may not know, it's like making a series of cuts um, in a piece of material to sort of give it a little bit more pliability. Um, and it, it worked out in pieces of square tubing too. So I basically made cuts in it, uh, bend it around a form that I make, and then weld the seams back together. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You have any, any other, like, um, I, like the patinas and stuff. You, you, I've, I love that it's clear you're familiar with woodworking or wood mm -hmm. as a material because yeah. it translates yeah. so well. Like, it looks like, yeah, it looks like it's made of wood. Is the patina process, yeah. like, something you had to develop yourself or... Uh, not really. So for the most part, I use, um, I usually just spray paint my pieces and then I'll sand them back and then use a, a rust solution, which I learned from Vivian Beer. It's a mixture of uh, peroxide, um, distilled white vinegar and salt, and then it rusts oh, wow. it immediately. Yeah. 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 It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. The, 
yeah, the body of work you've come up with and uh, references to classical, like classic furniture pieces. For a long time, I felt like I was kind of not really excluded from the woodworking community, but I didn't really feel like I had a voice in it necessarily because like I'm, I wasn't specifically a woodworker. I was like definitely more so a metal worker. Um, so this body of work really like I feel like I was able to make something that was really representative of like myself and my personality and like my ideas about craft and furniture making and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know. No, I do love that. Working in multiple medias, do you feel like you identify more as a woodworker or metal worker? obviously more leaning towards metal, but has, do you feel like you have to define yourself in between those two things or? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I've often like now the answer is no, but I think previously I did feel like I needed to kind of define myself in those, in those sorts of terms. Cause for a while, I mean, it still is like furniture making and woodworking are so, um, like conjoined basically to one another. Mm -hmm. It's like, like a lot of people assume that if you are a woodworker or a furniture maker, that you are one and the same, right? So like if you're a furniture maker, then you obviously work in wood and, and sort of vice versa. Um, and while I do, I do make wood furniture, it's not really in my, it's not like the main thing that I do. And it's, it's um, metalworking and, and welding is more, it's something I just fell in love with more, easily and it mm -hmm. just kind of like I had that moment where it just like clicked as soon as I did my first TIG weld I was just like man I'm not gonna <laughs> go back to doing anything else really mm -hmm. um, but now I'm sort of sort of I am like in between like the gray area between like craft and art I'm finding because mm -hmm. I get asked a lot um if my pieces are functional and like they are to an extent, but I don't really see them being like, I don't see myself making 10 of the same chair for someone to use at a, like a dining room table. Right. Sure. So, but even though I make them all to be functional mm -hmm. because I am a furniture maker at, at, at heart. Um, so now I'm sort of like, well, I guess I just really make sculptures of chairs that, and they look like chairs. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah. So now I, I do metalworking, I do woodworking, and I guess I do sculpture now too, which is, I went back to going into the sculpture route. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's cool. And it kind of ties into what I did want to talk to you about today was the upcoming show that you're going to be in. Yeah, the seating assignment show at the Sawtooth uh, School of Visual Art. Um, yeah, it opens on Saturday, so March 23rd. Um, it's open through May 11th. Uh, and it was curated by Rebecca Juliet Dew. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right. Um, and she was a resident at the Sawtooth School. And um, this is actually, the show is actually in conjunction with Salem College and their side chair library. Um, so when Rebecca visited the side chair library at Salem College, she noticed that there was pretty much a lack of female representation in um, the chairs that were there and chair designers that were there. Mm -hmm. so she felt compelled to create a show that was highlighting a lot of women chair makers and furniture makers, especially those in craft education as well. So that's sort of what the exhibition's about. And I'm just very happy to be included in that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a bunch of great, great chair makers that are going to be involved in that show. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was really great having you on. I appreciate um, you talking with us about your work and a little bit about the show. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having <laughs> me. <laughs> Amanda, Sophie's awesome. She's great. Her work is her work is incredible. Really good. Arkburn Furniture, A C R B U R N underscore furniture furniture uh we'll we'll post a link her instagram is pretty revealing of of her work so yeah it's it's worth it's worth checking out if you're in the north carolina area definitely check out that show <laughs> go to that show yeah there's a bunch of really good chair makers in that in that show for me though i really wanted to hear more so i wonder if the audience wants to hear more too and i was thinking maybe we could do uh if everyone could send in some, you know, metalworking for woodworkers type question and maybe have her back on for a full show. That would be a really fun episode because I, yeah, I know it. I didn't think about how it translates. 
so well. Yeah. And in, in the whole curve bending metal. I know. I know. I yeah. got. <laughs> I, I would love to do a follow up interview on that. Yeah. Well, everyone write in if you want to hear more from Sophie. And uh, let's finish out the show. More Vic and Andrew. I have a thing that's happening in the shop right now. Is okay. that is that a is that a thing that we can? That doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure with some penicillin <laughs> it will clear right up. But um, I have been in this shop for eight months, uh, which there's a pool going as to whether or not we'll actually make it a year. Um, but oh no, come on, don't the um, I set up the shop kind of hastily because if the shop's not set up, I'm not working. And if I'm not working, I'm not making money. And if I'm not making money, then, um, oh, I don't know. I just don't let that happen. But, um, so I set up the shop kind of in a hurry and it's been eight months. And so I've been hitting these little pinch points. I call them in the shop where it's like, oh, I don't like where that is. And, oh, that's driving me crazy. And so, um, the last thing that happened is I knocked over a giant eight quarter elm board, um, as I was reaching to grab something else. And I, so I just had enough. And so I am in full, like replan mode. <laughs> and so like, was it I'm tear like, down kind of? Cause I just saw a mess on Instagram, but right. It, it wasn't a tear down, okay. but it's like. No, I want to put this tool over there. I want to put this tool over there and I want to make this over here. And I'm sick and tired of that. And I redo. <laughs> and I just, I just basically, and then of course, to do that, you have to sort of ratify and fix one corner and then move stuff out into that corner and then work on the next spot. And then because I'm not, um, I'm trying not to bring stuff into the house because that wasn't a good scene the first time it happened. <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to like just compartmentalize things and do things. And so, um, but man, it's like every minute I'm not in there, it's driving me crazy because I, I like mentally picturing the state of it right now. And it's just like, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, happy place. Yeah, yeah. If my happy place isn't so happy, it's like completely disorganized and it's a mess, but I think going forward, it's, way. it's going to be, it's, so I'm using the old Japanese 5S um, system. Um, What's that? Um, so I wrote a, um, uh, you can link this in the, in the, in the thing. I, I did a blog on 5Sing your shop. And so 5S, I can't remember what all of the S's mean and they actually are um they're not S's they're Japanese words and so okay. <laughs> but basically um they sort of developed this system where like everything has a place and it needs to go to that place and it also has to do with maintenance and cleanliness and all of these certain things and basically like um a lot of industry uses the 5S system um in order to be compliant um, so that, you know, for safety reasons and for all of those sorts of things. So it's like, it's things like don't put a dull tool back mm -hmm. onto the shelf dull, right? Return it there in a serviceable condition so that when you go to grab it the next time, it's good. And so I do these sorts of things. Like you hear people talk about like 10 things, you know, like do 10 things before you leave the shop at the end of the day, do 10 things before you start your work at the beginning of the day, that sort of thing. So it's that sort of a mentality as well. It's like, take a moment to like get yourself organized because if I come back to the shop and it's destroyed because I've just been going at something, um, I, I have that chaos in my mind. Um, and it, and then it ends up translating into what I'm doing. Whereas if I clean up a little bit at the end of the day, if I, if I 5S the shop a little bit before I go inside, when I walk in the next morning, it just feels a little bit better yeah. for me. Um, so, but yeah, there was a, I did a blog post on, on 5S and, and how that, how that can really help you out in your shop. Cool. I, I totally agree. Your, your environment affects you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so. Like I can't even look over Ben's shoulder without feeling anxiety. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> I live in here, man. <laughs> that's that's the uh, 
that's that's what works for him right well you know, no right now uh, it's not that's working his happy place. <laughs> no no <Well>. so <laughs> i i have the problem where i have very i have like three distinct three or f- four distinct things that happen in this room one it's a, a wood shop it's also my work from home environment it's also like a little bit of a recording studio i have a whole bunch of guitars and ukuleles out here 3d printing out here and my kid and I build robots and the things have been just moving all into one big mess lately. And I do have distinct areas for all of them. Um, but honestly, like when, uh, when the, the Taunton office closed down and I had to bring home hard drives and stuff like that, that were at the office, like my office mess, it's it's yet to resolve since then. It's just been like this, that box over my shoulder and there's just stuff that's just always like, I move it over there because I need to work right here right now. And I need to spend two days doing that like you, Vic. Um, they just haven't come. And quite honestly, I need to spend more than two days working on things in my house right now. And I, I can't justify working on my shop right now. So that's where I am. And get it. Yeah. You get that, Andrew. You 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 juggled the two a lot for a long, long yeah. time. So and the way I, I I do it is I have my hand tool area, which is like my sacred area. Okay. Ten by ten. It's perfect. Everything is exactly I five S it <laughs> all the way. Um but outside of that ten by ten, I am not that way. <laughs> you know, and, and my wife is always like, I hear you talking about, you know, how Zen you're you're full. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? It's all right. I'll, I'll bleep it. <laughs> um, it, uh, but it, but it's true. I, I create that space because I it makes me do better work. Mm-hmm. Um, I like I I feel like everything has a visual noise and I want it quiet. Um, and that's my music. You know, you might have a different song that you like to listen to, so your visual noise, um, you know, to me might feel busy but to you it's the right song mm-hmm. so it's uh it, it's not necessarily empty uh is the right way that's my way um that's what works for me but i think everyone listens to a different song so that's a good way to describe it visual yeah. noise yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 not gonna top that yeah that's wow. tough nice. um well shall we answer a reader question a listener question yeah sure. um I'll tell you what, let's jump to this one because it's we're we're in shop zen status right now. So, dear Shop Talk Live crew, I will be moving to the Atlanta area this summer. Many homes here have daylight basements with at least one exterior door and several windows. Pretty sweet for potential woodworking shop. The basements in many of these homes that I'm previewing on real estate websites have already been finished out. Uh, often insulated exterior walls, drywall, carpeted in, and carpeting installed. I recall a Shop Talk Live discussion on shop flooring, mostly as regards as to what to do with alternative alternatives to bare concrete. I think Mike made a half joke, serious comment about carpeting. Um, it's likely that the house I buy will have a finished basement with a walkout basement that will be larger than my present single bay garage shop. My question is. If you had the option to leave the carpet in place, would you? Uh, in regards to table saw, bandsaw, workbench, assorted bench top machines, um, I have a large lathe. For my turning area, I would remove the carpet and install shop curtain around the turning zone to keep shavings and sweeping easy. So I have a hard time wrapping my head around this because as you can see, I do not vacuum dust very much. So carpet with our two... Uh, they're two 5s aficionados <laughs> do you think that's a doable from from a maintenance standpoint for either of you andrew i like it i like it better than concrete yeah honestly and and it i guess depends on the carpet yeah um like an industrial really tight mat is much better than a shag carpet <laughs> um <laughs> You know, I, certainly, I feel like you could get away with the with a tight knit. Uh, in fact, uh, Brian Holcomb's shop, uh, who's an excellent furniture maker, maker, um, is a basement shop with with that tight carpet. Okay. Um, so it's I, I think it's 
It's doable. He's, if I remember correctly, a neat freak too, dust wise and it's what's that um, Brian's yeah. shop. Yeah, Brian. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So again, dust collection. Mm -hmm. I, I, it doesn't. It's not ideal. No. Okay. <laughs> I think it's better than concrete uh, on lots of uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but no, I would tear it all up and put wood floors. Down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, sleepers and uh, and plywood. Okay. Because um, I love love my sharp blades too much. I I, I don't do concrete on the floors um, ever. <laughs> um, blades fall on the floor and they don't like concrete. Mm. Um, that's that's kind of reason number one. Um, but th then there's condensation, and we should talk about that because. Uh, he's in Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, in the basement, and that's that's a big big concern. So you can you can give your two cents on carpets, uh, Vic, and we can we can talk yeah. uh, conversation maybe after that. I mean, Vic, you've you've had seventy three shops, so has any one of them been carpeted? <laughs> Not a single one. Really? Um, no. Yeah, they haven't. Um, and I think I don't know. I'm I'm of a couple of minds on this question because. At first, I had this reaction like carpet, really? No. And then, uh, but then I thought about it, and it's like, okay, well, if if it was a, like Andrew said, if it was a tight woven sort of industrial cord carpet that is like super low pile and all that other kind of stuff, I think it would probably be okay. Um, you would want to have a, a like a good way to vacuum that mm -hmm. um, because I feel like you know people worry. People tear out carpets and houses because of, you know, dust issues and, and all that other stuff. And it's like, imagine in a shop, like it would just be, <laughs> you know, it could be bad if your dust collection is not up to par. Um, well, and I think I a mean, lot of people. Br bringing it to what Andrew might have been hinting at, but now that you're making me think is like, you know, the dust gets deep down in that carpet and then it uh -huh. absorbs water. Right. And then all of a sudden you've probably got a mold issue, maybe. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, I mean, carpet shouldn't be in basements, really. <laughs> no, it really <laughs> not, shouldn't. Not, not my basement. <laughs> right. Um, I, I see. I see water in our basement, so carpets don't want to see that. Yeah. So, huh. but but standing. I mean, standing on concrete is 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 not good. Um, and and I know everybody's shop is concrete. Every school I teach in is concrete. Um, and it really puts me on edge. I, my body doesn't like it, but really that that listening for that ping 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 of someone's chisel falling on is a constant um worry um that again i i don't have with a wood floor now you have mats right Vic? concrete uh, and mats uh no actually i don't have mats i have concrete um but i don't have mats i've worked on wooden floors and prefer it um and in fact uh in this shop um there's a bit of a slope, which is good because that's, you know, for a garage, it's, you know, good for drainage and all that other stuff. But, but that in mind, it is noticeable. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, and so I actually have my bench, um, wedged so that it is sitting straight, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like this, because it just feels weird for me. Um, but I've seriously thought about leveling the floor uh, by putting in sleepers and getting it like totally done and then putting like a tongue and groove plywood. Um, and then um, I think I would just stop there. I don't think I would go and do yeah. like, you know, actual hardwood floor um, as pretty as that would be. Um, I don't think it makes sense. Um and then like a vapor, like a, some sort of like water protection layer underneath it, um, just to, you know, and they make those plywood tiles that have that built into it and all that other stuff. There's no yeah. end of money that you could throw at the idea, but, um, somebody told me horse mats can be yeah. good. Yeah. We've, we've, we've yeah. had people talk about them and I, I've, I've actually measured it out and I think I could, I could put four in here and be done. And, uh, yeah, it's, and those aren't, those aren't cheap. No, no, it would be cheaper than putting a floor in here. I know that, yeah. but, and, and again, there's headroom issues, but you could get away with a, a one inch pressure treated sleeper with a three quarter ply on top. And 
that that would be my first choice. Is yeah, is for sure. Down. Um, but so the other issue is in a basement shop, especially in Atlanta. I think he said he was from. Um, is that and an exposed concrete floor is going to be fifty five degrees. Um, it's going to hold that that ground temperature. Uh, and it's, if you open a window or you open a door and that 90 degree humidity, humid air comes in, it's going to condense, uh, on that, uh, on that, on that floor. Um, so it depends on how well he conditions the space. Mm -hmm. Um, same with the walls. They would want to be insulated. Um, they'll have the same issue with being too cold and that warm air just, just drops its moisture when it, when it hits that cold surface. Uh, so that's something to, you know, factor in as well another reason to go to wood <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. Well, it sounds like, it sounds like, uh, um, Fred's going to have a nice setup though. He's getting a bigger shop and that's fine. Yeah, that, that's a shop is better than no shop. Oh yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, um, but, uh, and, and concrete is great because you can move things around, you can roll tools around. Um, so, you know, there's advantages to everything, but, I'm a, I'm a no concrete <laughs> wood, wood guy. And in every shop I've had, I've, I've brought floors in. I, I, I actually have panels, pine panels that I've put in to shops, mm -hmm. worked on and then brought with me. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And now's the time to do it. Like if he hasn't moved in yet, now's yeah. the time to rip up the carpet and put the floor down. Not when you have it full of tools. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, then you're playing the push everything up against one wall game and doing half the floor and then pushing it all over on the other side, doing the other half of the floor. Um, much better to do it now. Um, all right. So this <clears throat> next question is complicated. We're going to do the, the walnut one, folks. Um, oh, yes. This one is uh, from Mike. And I just love that this job exists. I'm a double base bow maker by trade. Like I know they exist. I have friends who are <laughs> double base luthiers. Like, but I just I love it. I love this world. Um, and a, and furniture making is a hobby for myself. A few years ago, I made myself a dining table, and at the time, I did not understand the difference between steamed and non-steamed walnut, or that it was even a thing. The majority of the wood I bought was super cheap at an estate sale, either air dried or at least not steamed. I needed one extra piece for the top to be as wide as I wanted, which I got from a local lumber yard and it was steamed. Since I finished the table a few years ago, every day I look at the one strip of comparably ugly brown steamed walnut down the middle of the top sandwiched between two beautiful non-steamed boards. I have considered one day taking off, taking the top off the table and cutting out and replacing the steamed board. This would be straightforward, but the issue is that the top is attached via, he must be a fan of Andrew Hunter's, sliding tapered article. dovetails. <laughs> um, I luckily only glued the last few inches with hot high glue, so getting it out would, not be, would be a pain, but not impossible. Um continues on to talk about specifics of, of how he would do it. Um, first off, Mike built a beautiful table. The pictures oh, that yeah. were sent in. Yeah. This is a, I agree. I agree. Mike, you should be super proud yep. of yourself. Yep. No doubt. I hear you, Mike. I hear you. I don't think I'd touch it. I, I agree with Ben on that one. Yeah. Same. Okay. It's uh, a gorgeous learn, table. No. Gorgeous and I, I love the question because it does bring up something very important, um, which is walnut yeah. <laughs> and air dried versus kiln dried versus uh, steamed. So in the yeah, raw, is the difference like identifiable? Amazing. It is unbelievable. Uh, but like, air like, dried. But like I know that, yes. that it's probably going to become more apparent as it ages, right? From across the room, I can. Okay. Yep. I can certainly, certainly the steam stuff okay. just looks like a chocolate bar um, from across the room. So the air dried, I mean, that's the thing is there is so much color in walnut that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, and air dried wood is wonderful, but it's hard to get. And I wish we all just, you know, had had resources for air dried. But uh, it has purple. 
in gray and reds in it, um, especially hand planes without any treatment on it. It's, it's just, it's a different, it's, it's not dark brown anymore. <laughs> uh, so much variety. Um, kiln dried takes some of that out. Um, kiln dry will take some of that very inch out, a lot of the purple, a lot of the reds, uh, but it still leaves the sapwood white. Um, so they steam, um, and really the steaming is to make it all sort of one uniform color, uh, so that the industry can grab two boards, glue it together and have a tabletop that, you know, matches. Um, but again, for the rest of us who are <laughs> caringly taking one board at a time and building a table, um, I wish they were not steaming, uh, and taking that character out. It's true. Yeah. Um, so if he was going to, and Mike did say that he's on the fence about it. If he was going to, I think I would strip it and try and tone the wood to match before taking the table apart. But I, th that was my first thought. Too. Okay. Cause it's like, what do you got to lose then? Like is tape it off and uh, try to just give some red to it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, I'll even, I mean, you could even, well, yeah, you'd have to strip it, but, but you could tone it with waxes and stuff. But, yeah. Yeah. You, but yeah. you, you know, you, you're going to have to, uh, if I'm looking at it, it looks a little Brown needs more red. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Just get some dye and, and try. Um, I've done it with cherry. Um, yeah. I've, um, I ended up using a piece of sap wood that, I mean, at the time it was the wood that I had and it was uh, what I had to use. And so I ended up toning it ahead of time with some cherry stain, um, which like it didn't make it not look like cherry. Um, it looked, it looked, uh, like older cherry. It got darker, um, which I could have done with an hour's time out in the sun, but, um, but the, um, it didn't, it didn't get rid of the sap. You could still see that it was a little bit lighter, but at least then it was like tone on tone. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, the same saturation or what have you. But, um, so yeah, the first, when I saw this question, I was like, oh man, I wouldn't be cutting up this table or for anything. Like I, I would do whatever it's I such could. A table. Yeah. yeah. I would do whatever I could because anything you try to do to that, like I, even though it's, uh, well, even though it's, um, um, hide glue, like that's still a bear to loosen up. And then if it's a, in a sliding tapered dovetail, that's gonna, it, he probably had to drive it home. And over the years, that thing would have locked up and like, there's, yeah, it's not that simple to just. I'm, do you think that there is a plausible way of replacing a board and duplicating the joinery on the un underside. Thankfully, the un the joinery is on the underside of the table, right? So it's not going to be something that haunts them all day long if if it doesn't work out perfectly. Uh, but I mean, a slide a sliding taper dovetail is not easy to accomplish to begin with. Um, but starting from scratch, it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to match one, don't you think, Andrew? Yeah. Um, I I had two solutions. Okay. Um, First and foremost is avoid it to begin with. Um, denatured alcohol on your boards will will show the color if before you glue up. You know, just knowing that that's a possibility that all trees are different colors on the inside, um, and uh, yeah, either buy from the same tree or check before you glue things up. Um, so once it is glued up and you want to take it apart. Um, the first and most important thing I would say is to draw reference lines, okay. um, draw a line through the table so that you can put it back together on that line. Um, that would be the first thing I want to do before I destroyed anything. Uh, and also draw lines on the sliding dovetail, um, uh, cleat where that board is. So again, you know, you have your reference before you change anything. Okay. That's, uh, so you can come back and measure and, um, Getting it apart, hide glue is great. <laughs> Again, that's uh, that's another reason to use hide glue. Um, 
steaming it, you know, with a, uh, with a, with a steamer will help, um, heat water. Um, but for the most part, I think if he routed that plug on the end and just beat it with a chisel, it'll come out. Uh, and the taper should come out with, even if it is glued on the end with a big hammer. Um, so once it's apart, <laughs> it was either put them together, you know, get a new board in there and put it in there and then trace, um, where that dovetail would be and recut it. And then maybe use the dovetail cleat while you're gluing it up. So you're lining everything, which again, sounds like trouble, or maybe you would glue it up without the dovetail cut in that one board and then use a guide and a bushing uh, to route it in place after the glue up. Uh, and that way you're aligned. Um, but again, you need that one line that you drew originally to get them all in the, in the same line. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> now that I say it out loud, <laughs> it is a beautiful table. It, yes. um, and, 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 a, and nobody knows it, but you, and now us. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Like, nobody knows it. Nobody's bothered by it, but you and, and yes, we see it, but we think it's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, okay. So back to, back to devil's advocate. Would it maybe be worth it if you were to do this to just leave the sliding dovetail area of that board as a non as a dado and right. to not have the joinery on that one board let the other three boards in the top carry the the weight <laughs> you know um because i think matching that is oh gosh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be rough dude so this is not gonna yeah. be popular but I would rather paint the top black <laughs> than disassemble that table because yeah, you, will run into, you will run into yeah. no end of awfulness trying okay. to get that apart, beating it apart, getting the, like, it just, the, again, I think the overwhelming response from the three of us is just leave it alone. Like yeah. it's, we all make mistakes. It's yeah. a beautiful thing and you will never, ever do that again. <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay. I, I have things all around me that I've made where I think, oh, I wouldn't do that again. Or, oh, I yeah. wouldn't do that again. Right. And those are important things. And the best thing is, is he wrote this question and now we talked about it and now other people won't make the same mistake. Hopefully. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. And that's They're, important. Uh, and that's why yeah. it's important on Instagram to show your mistakes yeah. because yeah. you learn way more from people's mistakes, or at least you would hope, um, you know, um, than, than, you know, thinking that everything just comes out roses all the time because it certainly, it certainly doesn't. I, it do that. does for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> Andrew and I will talk about that offline. <laughs> <laughs> well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Next episode, we are calling out for questions. Amanda is going to be talking to two pros who work in production shop environments, professional cabinet shops. You know, maybe you've been curious about getting a job at a production shop or are curious about what life is like working as a pro woodworker from nine to five. This is a great opportunity to be heard and get your question answered. So send those questions in or any questions in uh, about woodworking, at least to shop talk at fine Again, that is shop talk at fine If you're watching on YouTube, we always appreciate you clicking that thumbs up button. If you feel called to, if you feel like we've earned it, a five-star review on iTunes is just the piece de resistance. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks a lot for listening. Bye. Hi, welcome to Shop Talk Live. This is... <laughs> I'm interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try that again. Yeah, sorry. I, I just I didn't know you were right going. I didn't know yeah. you were going. All right.